Well, so now having briefly described the role of quantum statistics for certain systems and uh, discussing the conditions under which we really need to bother about incorporating quantum statistics, uh, we will now see another example where we really actually have to incorporate quantum statistics and classical statistics is not sufficient. In our previous uh, lecture, we have seen that <coughs> the quantum statistics becomes important or the quantum uh, mechanical uh, uh, behavior of the system becomes dominant whenever the interparticle separations in the system is comparable to the de Broglie wavelength of the particles. So the same idea was uh, then realized in case of conduction electrons in the metal. So we will be seeing this uh, and I think you have done it uh, uh, if not in detail then probably in brief in your solid state course but uh, anyway uh, we will be doing it briefly here so Drude's, uh, Drude actually suggested that electron gas behaves like free gas of moving uh, particles inside the metal so the electrons inside the metal behaves as if those are the particles which can move freely inside the metal and uh, there is another thing uh, which he uh, assumed and that was that these electrons although they are charged particle but they do not interact means coulomb interaction he neglected and uh, at the same time he treated those uh, uh, electrons to be identical to the particles of the uh, ideal gas identical to the particles of the ideal gas means they can roam around just the way they uh, the particles of ideal gas roam around and uh, at the same time he assumed that okay those charged particles can lead to uh, i mean a net movement of charged particles in a certain direction uh, which we can relate to the drift velocity that can lead to the current so the charge the nature uh, of electrons um, charged nature of electrons is manifested only in in the form of the current in the metal other than that there is no reaction so they are like free electrons anyhow anyhow so that Drude's theory used uh, classical statistics as it was used for uh, uh, ideal gas and uh, then he could explain some of the properties uh, uh, say for example Drude's formula for electrical conductivity of the metals you may go back to your solid state physics book and then try to see it there and by using that uh, classical statistics he could partially explain certain things but not completely so there were certain uh, uh, effects like uh, electrical conductivity thermal conductivity thermoionic emission he, he tried to talk about them and try to explain them but he could not explain those uh, uh, i mean with his theory he could not explain the observed results to a very good accuracy <laughs> uh, though his idea was good enough but uh, what what was lacking was that he was treating those electrons as classical particles so we will be now seeing why uh, they had why the electrons uh, in metal had to be treated quantum mechanically so now let us assume that every atom has one conduction electron let's just take a simple case of uh, some metal in which each atom in the unit cell uh, contributes only one conduction electron so for example sodium cesium all those are uh, uh, first group elements and uh, then in that case we can try to write down expression for typical charge density of the electrons again how to calculate charge density of uh, uh, electrons in the metal uh, we have done it in solid state physics if not you can go to uh, the book by Ashcroft Marmin in first chapter he gives the details how you actually calculate charge density but that's not very uh, difficult uh, even i mean the idea is very simple you take volume of the unit cell uh, means for that you take lattice constant of the unit cell 
uh, say suppose you have a cubic cell then uh, you take the lattice constant and uh, a cube will be uh, volume right and then how many atoms are there in the unit cell that you count and uh, then from that um, say for example if the unit cell is fcc and for fcc you have total uh, say four atoms in the unit cell if we say that okay the basis is monatomic so if it is fcc and you have four atoms in the unit cell then uh, how many uh, electrons in one unit cell so each atom now that is where this idea uh, is to be uh, incorporated means each atom contributes only one conduction electron so in that case in unit cell you will be having four electrons in case uh, each atom contributes uh, say two electrons for example calcium then in that case you have to take two electrons each atom so in say fcc unit cell of calcium the number of electrons will be four into two eight so i am sure you are familiar with that idea now in that case if we try to find out the number density of the electrons then typically this turns out to be now i don't know what lattice constant he has used he has not mentioned it here uh, so you can go there in the ashcroft merman book and you can find out the values of uh, uh, electron densities so the typical values of electron densities for metals turns out to be of this order say 5 of the order of 10 to minus 23 oh again i doubt this should be plus 23 because in one centimeter cube of uh, the unit cell it's not possible tends to minus 23 electrons so this is wrong again there are so many typos in this book but anyhow the, the contents are uh, in order as we need so that's why we have to follow this but okay you fix it up so it should come out to be of the order of 10 to the power 23 electrons per centimeter cube oh okay okay sorry fine uh there is some confusion this guy has created so it's not number density so this is what he's confusing here with this expression it's not number density actually it is volume per electron so this is this this is correct volume per electron will come out to be uh, of the order of this so this this is not n uh, this is not number density i mean uh, that's what is confusing here but uh, this is simply the volume per electron let me quickly have a look in the book what is uh, if i have written it in a wrong way or it is wrong in the book itself uh, just a minute uh, so is it yes So this should not be n here i, I think i probably has um, uh, written it in a wrong manner and i have okay in book at one point he writes n is equal to v by n this is wrong it's not n that's not number density for sure uh, it is volume per atom and at second point he writes it is simply as v by n so actually number density is equal to n over v number of electrons per unit volume that's what is number density and its units are per centimeter cube so there is a uh, inconsistency here so please note it carefully that this is v by n this is volume per electron not number density number density is reciprocal of this number density is n over v so number density will come out to be of the order of 10 to 23 but the volume per electron will come out to be of the order of 10 to the power minus 23 i hope the point is clear now why we need this we need this to obtain that l so l is cube root of this right again i mean he has done certain blunders or i mean i don't know he has probably written just approximate orders uh, so in this case also uh, you try to evaluate cube root of this this number comes out to be not exactly this but probably this gives you this gives you order of magnitude so if you take uh, 10 raised to the power 23 cube root of it then it should come out to be overall of the order of this so that is the main message to take home and okay uh, this uh, interparticle separation this means inter electron separation in the metal will be of this order 
and raised to the power minus 8 centimeter 2 into 10 to minus 8 centimeter you can work up these numbers exactly in your notebook uh, to get a more uh, proper idea and how it comes that is also important so mass of electron you can take 9.1 into 10 to the power minus 28 gram uh, and if now we calculate uh, de Broglie wavelength I hope you remember what was the expression for finding de Broglie wavelength then de Broglie wavelength will uh, I mean let's not calculate de Broglie wavelength as such but okay let us assume that electron suppose they are having de Broglie wavelength of this value exactly this value interparticle separation that's where we will get an idea okay at what temperature that's what we want to find out in the next step uh, the quantum statistics has to be incorporated so if we take de Broglie wavelength to be equal to this and then from that formula for de Broglie wavelength we obtain the temperature then this temperature comes up to be very high 3 into 10 to the power 5 Kelvin this means that uh, so this is the expression uh, we have used for finding the temperature so I have uh, again uh, I mean this part I had done I was uh, doubting these numbers again and again so I tried to work up for one specific case and then when I found then this this number for me was not coming out to be exactly 3 I was getting it to be 1.29 so you can check if uh, I did the calculations correct so uh, but yes the main thing is or main uh, message of the story is that the order of magnitude is very very high so that is what is something very important means we must should have incorporated uh, the quantum statistics to understand uh, the behavior of electrons in a metal and that is what was uh, then later done by Sommerfield who treated those electrons in, uh, in metal uh, by a uh, Fermi Dirac statistics so and then uh, you know the rest of the story that then Sommerfeld uh, treatment could explain many things. So we will be discussing in general now, not exactly the Sommerfeld theory, the uh, this Fermi Dirac systems uh, in different uh, situations. Fine. So let us come back to the previous uh, lecture again. Uh, this was the expression for a number A naught, and then uh, we also had obtained the expression for the number of uh, particles how we can write down the number of particles in terms of uh, degeneracy or uh, fugacity factor now now you can see that this number this number uh, if we see from this equation then this num if I take this thing to the left hand side then this will be nothing but a naught isn't it so I can write down that a naught is equal to a this one only this thing will be left here so a minus upper a square uh, divided by 2 raised to the 3 all, all these things as such where what is kappa kappa is related to whether the system is uh, following Fermi uh, Dirac statistics or it is following Bose Einstein statistics means uh, whether we are dealing with fermions or bosons so k is equal to plus 1 for fermions and it is equal to minus 1 for bosons so now let us try to uh, express a the fugacity in terms of this number a naught why we are interested in this because this number a naught is related to the characteristics of the system so for example if you see from this expression it depends upon number of particles per unit volume it depends upon temperature of the system it depends on c where c if you go back to the expression for c in the book you will find out c depends on mass of the particles so <clears throat> that is how uh, this a naught is something which is related to the parameters or characteristics of the system so that is what we want to do now that we want to express fugacity in terms of these characteristics of the system so rather than doing it directly i mean trying to uh, rearrange thing, things here what we do is okay let us put a to be equal to a naught plus in terms of a naught by using this expression say so a naught plus kappa into a a naught square plus higher order terms maybe uh, you may have higher order terms so but we will be neglecting them so I'm not writing it as such where a is some unknown this small a we have to find out what for what value of a this a can be written as uh, this series in terms of a naught uh, 
so that is what we want to find out and uh, to determine a what we can do is we can substitute this value of a here in this equation on right hand side so this is what we have done here so a naught is equal to a naught plus this thing whole for this then minus kappa over 2 raised to the 3 by 2 a square so a square is not, nothing but the square of this whole series and higher order terms but now let us rearrange the things and uh, keep ourself only to the uh, second order term here a naught square and if you rearrange the things a naught will cancel here uh, and here higher order terms will go down uh, and we don't want to consider them so then what we will be finding is that this will be the, giving one term for a naught square then from here as well we will be finding so this is a plus b whole square you can try so this will be a square plus b square plus 2ab right so the term of uh, a naught square will be coming only from this part even 2ab if you take 2 into a naught into this thing and that will be term containing a naught cube so we are ignoring all the higher order terms except from uh, a naught square so that is why what we shall be left with here uh, so k naught so i mean k over 2 raised to 3 by 2 a naught square right so if we rearrange these things so a naught will cancel both ways so the multiple of a naught square has to be zero in order for this equation to be satisfied and that will happen you can do this as a small homework uh, that will happen when small a comes out to be equal to 1 over 2 raised to the power 3 by 2. So that is how, from uh, what we obtained value of small a. So if we put the value of small a, then in this expression we can write down now a in terms of uh, say a naught. And of course we will be ignoring higher order terms so we don't need to bother. Now, if we use this, this uh, representation for A, then we can uh, write down the expression for energy as follows. So, energy is equal to, so I hope you remember the uh, expression for energy in our previous lecture. So, there we are now substituting the value for A. Fine, so this will be A minus kappa over 2 by 2 raised to 5 by 2 A naught square. So there will be a square term here. So uh, here again, we want to restrict ourselves to the second order term, I mean term of uh, up to A naught square. So we can find out that energy will be equal to CV, ABT raised to 5 by 2, gamma 5 by 2, A naught plus so this term plus uh, <coughs> upper A naught raised to the A naught square divided by 2 raised to the power 5 by 2. Now again, you would say from where this comes so you have to uh, simplify these two terms and then i'm sure you can get this try to do it yourself i leave it as such uh, so now uh, if we see things further from here what we can do is okay we can take from here a naught common then this will be one plus kappa a a naught over two uh why Two here, not two raised to the power five by two. Uh, is because uh, okay, just a minute. A naught we have taken common gamma five by two. It is fine. It should be two raised to the power five by two again. I okay 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 fine got it so now what we have done actually is that we have expressed uh, uh, things in terms of a here we have incorporated a here right so what will be a a is nothing but 1 divided by 2 raised to the power 3 by 2 so that is why 2 raised to the 3 by 2 uh, goes in a and that is why we are left only with a fine anyway now let us use uh, this uh, expression for gamma function i hope you are aware of this relation that gamma of uh, uh, z plus one is equal to z into gamma z so that's what we have used so gamma five by two can be written as three by two into gamma three by two 
if you are confused, then you can go back to previous lecture probably, I think. Uh, if not there, I, if I have not mentioned it there, you can go to any book on mathematical physics. You can find it very easily. Or you, you can even Google for gamma function. Then you can see the properties of gamma function. Again, I leave it to you. No problem. So now, if we use this, then uh, what we can find out is that this energy E is equal to 3 by 2 n k b t 1 plus this thing. I mean, so this is what we have uh, written after simplification. Now, this simplification seems to have done uh, many things. Let us, uh, okay. So here we have uh, put the value of C uh, as well as uh, of uh, gamma 3 by 2 fine so if uh, i then you can find out the value of gamma 3 by 2 i i think i have written it in the previous lecture again i'm not uh, <clears throat> doing it exclusively so what you do is if you simplify these things then you can find out that this expression for energy comes out to be equal to 3 by 2 n into kbt 1 plus kappa a a naught divided by 2. So, okay. So, I leave the simplification to you. Fine. Let us talk the physics part of it. Now, the physics part of it comes from here. This, this energy, this means energy for, uh, we are still discussing weakly degenerate quantum systems, right? So, energy for um, weakly degenerate quantum systems. Uh, this is the classical energy 3 by 2 n k b t right so this will be either greater than again the same thing i mean uh, as we discussed i think in the previous lecture um, that okay the energy will be greater than uh, classical energy for fermions because this is plus 1 for that case and it is less than classical for bosons because a is minus 1 so that's another manifestation we can see from here. And then C, let us write down the specific heat at constant volume. So this follows from this expression, simple. And if we take the derivative, so what we can write down? Uh, we can write down that energy is, I mean, so we know energy is equal to this. If we multiply this, fine. We are first writing energy, not derivative directly, fine. So this plus uh, 3 by 4 is 3 by 2 into 1 by 2, 3 by 4. Kappa A N K B T uh, K B into alpha into T raised to the power minus half. Now from where this factor of uh, T raised to the power minus half came? This came from this uh, A naught. Uh, but it is just a minute. Huh? A naught in this equation has t raised to power minus 3 by 2, correct? Therefore, to obtain the expression for heat capacity at constant volume, first rewrite. This should be. Um, okay. A naught is uh, fine, got it. So, A naught is uh, uh, say t raised to power minus 3 by 2, right? A naught is proportional to because we are only bothered with derivative with respect to temperature so we don't need to bother about other factors here so we are saying some constant thing so this has t raised to minus 3 by 2 and of course t uh, which is coming from this factor here so t raised to minus 3 by 2 when multiplied by t will lead us to t raised to power minus half so now this is the expression for energy in terms of temperature now if we take this derivative of this thing with respect to temperature we can find out that the specific heat at constant volume uh, will be equal to 3 by 2 n kb that's your uh, simple first term coming from this and this will give you minus 3 by 8 so if you take the derivative of this this will give you all these terms and t raised to power minus 3 by 2 so i'm sure you are comfortable with taking derivatives so don't need to uh, tell how it comes well so if we uh, rearrange these things uh, what we can say, we can now again try to put things in terms of A naught. You can rearrange these things and obtain because this alpha into t raised to power minus 3 by 2 was nothing but A naught. 
So that's what we have done. So we, we can write down heat capacity like this. And uh, here again, if we take 3 by 2 n k beta common, I mean this one, 3 by 2 n k b common. So what we shall be left here is 1 minus this thing. So you can see this comes out to be equal to this. Uh, uh, k a a naught k beta is already out so that is fine now if we uh, try to see this expression then what we can find out is that yeah if we see this expression then we can see from here that specific heat for a bose einstein system will be higher because uh, this kappa is uh, minus 1 for Bose Einstein case, so this will be minus minus plus. This is classical counterpart, so specific heat for Bose Einstein system will be higher than that of corresponding classical uh, value. And uh, it is further lower, in fact, for a Fermi Dirac system because there kappa has to be plus 1, it is less than this. So, this is how we can compare effect of quantum. Uh, nature of the system on specific heat so this can be another question i mean you may face uh, as a question that uh, prove that uh, the specific heat or heat capacity of a uh, uh, bose einstein system is higher than classical counterpart and that of fermi dirac is lesser so this is how you can manifest this thing you have to actually arrive at this result fine how the differences are in general I mean okay the the quantum effects are not very very strong so these differences are not really very large so this is also you should keep in mind now there is one question we have almost completed this full story of uh, weakly degenerate quantum systems but then um, you should ask a question where we really talked about the weakly degenerate character of these systems where we have exclusively talked okay this is the thing which actually refers to the weakly degenerate nature of these systems right this is not done as such i have not exclusively mentioned but yes the weakly interacting particles are those for which the separation between the energy states uh, neighboring energy states rather we can say is very very thin means they are very closely spaced uh, why so because i mean those are the cases if you talk of a particular classical system then energy is practically continuous right there is no uh, problem classically for energy of a system to be continuous but when we are talking of these systems we are saying energy is not continuous i mean it's not continuous as such it is closely spaced uh, states closely spaced energy states so that is why we are taking integral over the energies we are taking integrals to describe the energies fine then for and, and these are the systems where we can treat the energy as continuous and then okay then you will say okay where is quantum physics coming so i mean weakly degenerate systems means those are treated with quantum statistics we are applying fermi dirac statistics or bose einstein statistics and at the same time we are treating the energies of those system to be continuous that's the main thing uh, which we need to notice here it means weakly degenerate quantum systems refers to the systems for which the energy is still continuous but the statistics which we are using to describe them is a quantum statistics we are using either bose einstein statistics or fermi dirac statistics those systems refers to the weakly degenerate quantum systems where the spacing now then what is the other way the other way is uh, important when the spacing between uh, neighboring states is not so small as compared to kbt in suppose the energy spacing between energy any two energy levels is not uh, really very small in comparison to say the thermal energy kbt so in that case 
we can't uh, treat, use the treatment which we discussed now. So means this this may happen at uh, low temperatures. ABT is uh, small. In that case, uh, what will happen? ABT is small. Yeah, if if temperature is small, then KVT is small. And energy spacing is large in that case we can't apply such description means low temperature or strongly quantized systems strongly quantized means suppose the particles are very strongly interacting with each other and uh, <clears throat> their strong interaction is leads to the quantization of energy levels and the separation between those energy levels is very large in comparison to the thermal energy for example hydrogen atom say that's one simple example where uh, Take the interaction between nucleus and electron. The energies are say say minus 13.6 over n square. So you can find out that if you compare those energies for different values of n, e1, e2, e3, or n is equal to 1, 2, 3, then the energies comes out to be of the order of electron volts. And if you talk of KBT, typical energy, then at room temperature it is of the order of milli electron volt. It's something like 25 milli electron volt at room temperature. And uh, then this means electron volt, milli electron. So thermal energy is very, very small. So such systems are not weakly degenerate systems. So they have to be treated um, in a different manner. And another situation may be uh, the situation when temperature is zero or at very low temperature, right? So there is one, there are two factors here. If the energies, if the separation between energy states is very large, then what will be the case? And second situation may be even if the spacing is very close to each other, temperature is very low, and uh, then what will be the case? So those cases will also be actually deviating from the classical behavior a lot. And uh, then those systems are called strongly degenerate systems. Now, in our next class, we will be talking about strongly strongly degenerate systems. So strongly degenerate systems of uh, bosons uh, goes to, say, for example, to a very lowest energy state and lead to very interesting phenomena, which we call Bose-Einstein condensation. And then for fermions, at uh, even zero Kelvin, the Fermi Dirac system is said to be alive. What do we mean by alive? Means uh, even at absolute zero Kelvin, the average energy of the particles is not zero, which classical statistics assumes means because as per classical statistics, the energy of the particles is of the order of KBT, right? So and as T is zero, so average energy of the particles should be zero, right? Uh, but in, in case of uh, say quantum statistics, specifically Fermi Dirac systems, they don't have average energy zero even at uh, absolute zero. So we will be now getting expression for uh, Fermi Dirac systems uh, at zero Kelvin and then you will see what is the expression for that energy. So these are certain interesting effects which comes out of the quantum uh, nature of the system and uh, they are very prominent in certain situations. That's what we want to uh, highlight here. <clears throat> now well uh, if we talk about total number of particles in the system, let us now try to move towards uh, strongly degenerate quantum systems, how we can describe them. So let us try to see how we will incorporate that thing. Now, if we write down the expression for total number of particles in the systems, then that will be nothing but the summation over uh, uh, S, say NS, where NS is the probability of occupying, this is occupation number, right? So this is just summation over this and uh, this thing where this kappa is accordingly uh, plus one or minus one whether the system is uh, bosonic, fermionic or bosonic respectively. Then uh, this is equal to, this we have already done. I mean, in terms of uh, each and receive, we are writing this same expression for total number of particles. A is uh, fugacity or degeneracy. Now, for post einstein system, when all the particles are confined to the lowest energy level, say E1 is equal to 0, let us say our lowest energy level is E1 is equal to 0, then the occupation number must be positive definite only for A less than or equal to 1. I mean, 
for absolute zero or if all the particles are in absolute zero level and a should be less than or equal to one why so because now now my question is from where this condition uh, uh, comes so if we actually take a to be greater than one let us assume other way let us take a to be greater than one fine if we take a to be greater than one then the factor of minus one in the denominator so a this is a factor of minus one now here a is greater than one so it is one over something correct which is greater than one so this will be this this will be less than one in say one over two this is 0.5 less than one one over three point three three less than one so if i take one over one that will be one that is a limiting case so in that case what will happen this is negative and uh, minus one actually this is something less than one this is also less than one so now what will what will happen in that case this is less than one no exactly we are taking say e1 is equal to zero so this is one fine in that case what will happen n will come out to be negative isn't it so you are subtracting a quantity which is less than one from minus one right so ultimately you will find out n is negative so that is unphysical total number of particles cannot be negative so that is why this restriction comes from this that a for that case has to be less than or equal to one i mean if you are talking of bose einstein condensation we have to take fugacity to be less than or equal to one we will be seeing it in the next unit so uh, no worries uh, fine now on the other hand if we talk of fermi dirac statistics then there is no such restriction on uh, a fine and in fact a can take any values uh, uh, and uh, if say ns approach is one say for a particular state if suppose it is uh, uh, occupied completely ns means occupation number for a particular state is one then in that case we can write down <coughs> that a approaches to infinity so you can just do substitution here if ns has to be one then what has to happen here uh, this has to be in, this term has to go to zero then and only we can have n s to be one so fine no problem so this difference in the values of degeneracy parameter between bose einstein and fermi dirac statistics which means for bose einstein statistics a has to be less than or equal to one right in case we are talking of lowest uh, all the bosons going to the lowest energy states and uh, for Fermi Dirac system, uh, the situation is very different, totally different. So that is why now we have to uh, can't discuss it in a general manner for both the systems, and that is why both systems have to be discussed separately. And that is why we have two separate units in our syllabus for discussing Einstein statistics and Fermi Dirac statistics. So now even strongly degenerate systems are uh, divided into two categories. One are called completely degenerate systems or completely degenerate systems, the degenerate systems for which temperature is equal to zero Kelvin. So T is zero and those are called completely degenerate Fermi Dirac systems. And uh, sorry, second uh, type of systems are called strongly degenerate systems, uh, but not completely degenerate. Those are the cases when temperature is very, very less in comparison to Fermi temperature. Uh, I define Fermi temperature. Uh, if not, we will be coming to this in the next, yeah, in next few slides, we will be coming to that. I mean, uh, we are talking of the case when temperature is not very high, but it is also not zero Kelvin. So, means these are two correct categories for uh, dividing the strongly degenerate systems, completely degenerate and strongly degenerate. Now we know Fermi Dirac systems. Now let us exclusively uh, talk about Fermi Dirac systems. So for Fermi Dirac systems, we can write down the occupation number as this one. And uh, if we begin with this, then we can, uh, okay. yeah. So now uh, we are focusing on zero Kelvin Fermi Dirac systems, means completely degenerate. So for a continuous distribution, as in the case of, say, for example, uh, electrons in a metal, we have energy uh, still continuous. But now we are talking of say, zero Kelvin. And we can write down. So
so here it is for discrete case so we are writing subscript here for sth energy state right so s is equal to one s is equal to two say e1 e2 e3 for example in the case of hydrogen atom uh, but here suppose energy is a continuous distribution as in the case of electrons in metals then we can write down this as a simple variable right where mu is a, a <clears throat> parameter called chemical potential till now we didn't talk about chemical potential in much more details now we will be seeing this in a little detail and for that we actually apply this condition the total number of particles has to be given by what integral of uh, this Fermi Dirac distribution function and this is nothing but the density of states right total number of states uh, this is the volume of the phase space and this is volume of each state in the phase space so this tells you total number of states right so here actually energy is related in terms of this pl the momentum that is how you can find out this is just uh, the density of state in some interval say e and e plus de so and we know that we have just seen it in our previous lecture that the density of state can be written as c into v e raised to the power half so this is i hope you remember we have done in the previous class so i'm not uh, into details of this so number of particles now can be written like this c into v v is a volume c is some constant which we have described or defined in previous lecture so this is how we can write down the total number of particles now at absolute zero kelvin let us try to look at occupation number so the occupation number should be zero or n uh, for the lowest energy states and uh, it will be zero for all higher energy states what does it mean it means this that whenever we have e s let's say, let's say this one whenever e is less than mu then what happens this number is equal to one why so e is less than mu right and e is less than mu then this is and t is zero here so fine this is e raised to the power minus infinity isn't it so because this is less than mu so this will be a negative number of course negative number divided by zero minus infinity so this term e raised to the power minus infinity can be written to zero so this means uh, nfd will be equal to one similarly when e is greater than mu then what will happen this will be a positive number right positive number divided by zero will give you a uh, e raised to the power infinity e raised to power infinity means denominator is infinite if denominator is infinite then this will be zero as well so uh, that's uh, what we have written here fine now this is how we can plot this um, uh, occupation number as a function of energy since energy is now a continuous variable so occupation number will be one for all the values up to this is e upon mu so whenever e is mu this is one right so up to mu this is one and then just when you enter for energy slightly greater than mu it will become zero occupation number or this another way of looking at it is that okay this is suppose energy states these are energy states then this is uh, say highest occupied energy state say mu we say at zero kelvin this mu is called fermi energy it means at zero kelvin chemical potential is nothing but fermi energy what you will have this is nf is one means probability of occupying those states is one and they are 100 percent occupied there is a full 100 percent chance that those states are all occupied and they are occupied up to ef and above that probability is zero it means the electrons or, or fermions in, in fact are filled completely up to ef and then above above uh, ef all these states are empty this can be seen to be something like okay a half filled glass of water means up to the level where the water has been filled that may be seen as to be like a fermi level below that uh, below that level on the glass there is water everywhere and above that there is no water same thing same case here so below fermi level there are the whole states are filled with electron there are all the electrons uh, present below Fermi level all the states are completely filled and above Fermi level all the states are completely vacant that's another way of looking at it 
so this i already told you that at uh, zero kelvin say that uh, this chemical potential is nothing but the fermi energy now let us uh, focus on this so if we use that uh, uh, definition of uh, this one nf then this integral rather than taking from zero to infinity we can even limit ourselves up to ef because above ef this will be zero this function will be zero so it doesn't make sense to go all the way from zero to infinity we can restrict ourselves from zero to ef and take this number to be simply one isn't it because below ef it is one and irrespective of e so that's what we have done here so that is how we can write down the expression for n now if we uh, solve this integral we can solve it very simple integral this will turn out to be equal to this now we substitute the value of uh, c and v here so you can go back and try to see what is the value of c so v is the volume as such so then we we will find out this turns out to be equal to this fine so that if we from here try to write down the expression for ef the fermi energy let us focus on this part only then from here we can write down ef is equal to 3 by 2 this will go that way n over c v raised to power 2 by 3 so that's the expression for fermi energy for a completely degenerate uh, fermionic system fine and uh, here again if we uh, rearrange the things and then put the value of c you can again go back and for you are rearranged from this one you will be able to find out this one i'm not going into details of this because this lecture is already running long so these basic things you can do yourself now let us apply this formalism to uh, uh, valence electrons in the metals so those uh, valence electrons in metals form a fermi gas and uh, uh, okay if we uh, uh, go back to how we can divide the electrons in different uh, compartments so in this case we are using spin of the electron as a dividing parameter so we can write down g to be equal to 2s plus 1 uh, where s is the spin of the electron and spin is half so we can write down value of g is equal to 2 into 1 by 2 plus 1 which comes out to be equal to 2 so we can put that value here actually and then we can write down the expression for fermi energy uh, from this this uh, expression for fermi energy comes out to be equal to h square over 2m uh, okay 2m this became here 8 because we have taken something common from here outwards uh, you can rearrange the things i again leave it to you uh, 3n divided by pi v raised to the power 2 by 3 this i have worked out this comes out to be correct uh, so i leave it to you therefore from here what we can see is that the fermi energy is uh, it, it depends on what is the mass of the fermions which we are discussing for electrons of course it will be mass of electron but there may be other other class of fermions as well so depending upon what class of particles you are dealing with you have to accordingly take their mass it also is proportional to the number density of the valence electrons i mean uh, for metals of course we are talking here then uh, it depends on what is what is the number density of the fermions in the system and uh, there's another interesting thing here is that it does not depend on temperature the fermi energy does not depend on temperature on the other hand we will see in the coming lecture that chemical potential do depend upon uh, temperature and when t is equal to zero that chemical potential becomes to be equal to fermi energy but fermi energy uh, as such doesn't have any temperature dependence we can define another parameter another parameter called fermi temperature now since having defined uh, fermi energy we can define fermi temperature as well so fermi energy follows from this expression we just have to tell what is the number density of the particles and then we can calculate fermi energy then if you define the uh, fermi energy with the boltzmann constant we will get fermi temperature and this is another way of defining fermi temperature so we just have put kb here nothing new so if we uh, use this expression we can compute uh, rather fermi energies and fermi temperatures for different metals 
So this table shows the values of Fermi energies and Fermi temperatures for various uh, uh, metals. Th this 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 number is wrong here. It should be plus four. So this is a typo. This is a typo here. Uh, this should be ten to the power four. You can check again. Go back to Ashcroft Marmin book, and then you can find out this should be ten to the power plus four. Uh, you can even try it yourself for lithium you take ef to be this just divide it with the boltzmann constant that's it this number should come to be close to this so that is how you can estimate the values of fermi temperature and uh, uh, fermi energies for different metals now if we uh, see from this table uh, we can note that the fermi energy uh, for metals can vary over a wide range it can go all the way from say see here from 1.58 for cesium to say 14.14 for uh, uh, beryllium right so you can try it as an exercise yourself that uh, you take a lattice constant for uh, lithium then uh, lithium contributes one electron take volume uh, of the unit cell number uh, what is the structure of uh, lithium and then try to work out it for fermi energy how it comes anyway and it is uh, lower for uh, monovalent metals and it is large for trivalent metals you can see all these things here and then um, of course this also leads us to a very high values of fermi temperatures you can see that fermi temperatures are of the order of 10 raised to the power 4 kelvin which is very high <laughs> Now let's see uh, how we can describe energy for such fermionic system. Then we can write down energy E is equal to this. This is already which we, which we have uh, uh, used earlier as well. So we can integrate this and then find out the energy. So this comes out to be equal to. So this is uh, E raised to the power 3 by 2. So E raised to 3 by 2 divided by, uh, I mean, in the integral will be E raised to power 3 by 2 plus 1 divided by 3 by 2 plus 1 I'm sure you can do this so this is what will give us the energy now if we talk about uh, something called there's something very interesting which we call zero point energy so what is zero point energy the zero point energy for a completely degenerate Fermi Dirac system now see since we are at zero Kelvin now this is where we we have to talk of that Fermi drug system being alive at even zero Kelvin as per classical statistics it should not have any energy right uh, so here what we can see is that uh, uh, okay let us try to write down uh, okay zero point energy of a completely degenerate Fermi drug system in terms of number of fermions now we are trying to uh, bring into picture the number of fermions so if we do this then we can write down E naught is equal to 3 by 5 N into EF. Uh, from where this expression came, let me just quickly have a look at uh, this. So just a minute. Huh? So there is an equation 14.35 and 14. Point three nine. So what is one? I think they have substituted the value of C here, but still, uh, let me check. Fourteen point three five. Have I written it? Maybe I probably should have put it. Uh, yeah. Uh, what we have, uh, yeah, what we have done here is actually we have used this expression for n. So if we put n to be equal to this, in this equation we can find out e naught is equal to three by five n into ef yeah this this we have already worked out in uh, previous slides so this means if we from here write down the expression for energy per fermion then e bar this is average energy per particle this will be e naught divided by n which is 3 by 5 times ef and you know ef is reasonably high of the order of electron volts so this means that for a fermi dirac system even at 0 kelvin its average energy, the average energy of the particles is reasonably high and comparable to uh, this one, Fermi energy, right? So this is why uh, we can say, this is a very, very 
contrast between classical and quantum system so for classical systems it should be zero but for quantum system uh, specifically for fermi dirac system it should it is reasonably high and that is why we say these are uh, alive even at uh, zero kelvin so now uh, for conduction electrons in silver he has worked out certain example again you can uh, you have you, you please pay attention to the numbers yourself the fermi energy comes out to be for silver is uh, 5.49 ev you cross check with the numbers so we can say that average energy for silver uh, average energy of electrons in silver metal comes out to be equal to 3.29 electron volt so you can now compare this energies now if we note this energy and compare this energy with the the corresponding maxwellian gas then we can find out that uh, the average energy of fermi drag system or average energy of fermions for case of say silver will be uh, <coughs> around uh, 3.29 and this energy at zero this is the energy at zero kelvin now in case electrons would have been described with the help of uh, maxwell boltzmann distribution then they would have possessed this much energy at a temperature of uh, 4 into 10 to the power 4 kelvin now we can find out this temperature by simply dividing this with boltzmann constant and then that should give you this temperature i haven't checked this factor again i mean you can try to do this as a homework divide this with Boltzmann constant so this temperature should be that much so this is uh, a very distinguishing feature of uh, Fermi Dirac systems or fermions that uh, even at absolute zero Kelvin they do possess uh, significantly high energy and this is uh, because of Pauli's exclusion principle which allows uh, which do not allow more than uh, one electron to be present in particular energy state and uh, particular means we are putting spin as well so if we say okay let us exclude spin then a maximum of two electrons can be present in a particular quantum state with their spin quantum numbers being different so this is something very important context of uh, Fermi Dirac systems if we want to calculate specific heat for Fermi Dirac systems then we can calculate that by taking derivative of energy and this is your energy so if you take the derivative so with respect to temperature and you can see here on the right hand side none of these factors have temperature dependence therefore uh, we can say that heat capacity of the fermion system actually is zero at absolute zero kelvin and uh, that's what is uh, also an interesting fact now there is another thing you can try to compute the pressure for fermion system and uh, for pressure we can use this basic definition of pressure hope you have done it in the previous uh, lectures somewhere i think i've done it in the first unit as well so if this is the definition the value of energy from here then just substitute and then can obtain pressure to be equal to this value now this result also shows something very interesting that if the electrons in metal were uh, say neutral particles as is the uh, assumption of uh, for, uh, this uh, d electron gas theory then uh, what should have happened is that they should possess a pressure of if you substitute the value for say i don't know for which i mean typical values if we do say fermi energy of say 3.29 even silver then you can find out c is uh, the constant which can be computing computed by substituting various values the main factor here is uh, mass of electron so you can go back and uh, look at the expression for c and then uh, obtain the value so finally if you convert that value of uh, uh, pressure then you can find out that this pressure comes out to be close to 10 to the 6 atmosphere so this number is enormously large 
enormously large means what this uh, result is showing that the <coughs> fermion uh, uh, fermion or what we can say electron gas inside uh, a metal or the valence electron inside the metal should possess such a high pressure and that is so and indeed the, met the electrons inside the metal should in fact blast out because it's a very huge pressure 10 to 6 atmosphere but that doesn't happen practically right so why because we are using here is that okay electrons are free particles and they do not interact they don't have any interaction with each other and uh, nothing uh, uh, and of any other sort but in practice in metal there are positive ions present as well so those positive ions keeps those electrons attracted to themselves which do balance for this pressure so that's why the metals doesn't blow then there is of course uh, also a concept of a fermi surface so it's a fermion systems and fermi surface i hope we have done in uh, solid state physics basically fermi surface is a surface of uh, constant energy and when that constant energy is equal to ef which is the surface in the reciprocal space or momentum space so if you take fermi energy draw sphere or say free electron gas case of radius ef then the surface area that sphere or surface of that sphere is called the fermi surface you would encounter this term most of the times in solid state physics there's another very important uh, uh, parameter in case of uh, fermionic systems and that is work function so basically work function is a measure of the amount of energy which is required to kick off the electron from the highest occupied state in the metals so at absolute zero kelvin you can say suppose this is the electrons are confined to this uh, uh, potential well of a depth say w then in that case what will be the highest energy of the electrons which are occupied at zero kelvin that would be fermi energy e now if some electron is here then the amount of energy which we kick off that electron will be <coughs> equal to uh, just phi i mean you have to supply at least this much energy which could overcome the uh, this uh, width of the potential well or confining potential for the electrons in the metal so that is work function that is how we can relate the work function to fermi energy so uh, we will be doing it in detail in uh, the section where we will be discussing the examples so this completes our uh, fermi dirac systems or fermion system that uh, absolute zero kelvin so are called completely degenerate fermi dirac systems next we will be talking about strongly degenerate fermi dirac systems now having done this uh, fermi temperature which is of course very very high of the order of 10 to 4 kelvin then uh, what does strongly degenerate fermi dirac system mean those are the systems which are fermi dirac systems which are to be are studied at a temperatures which are very very less in comparison to the fermi temperature of course not at absolute zero kelvin which we already discussed but at finite temperatures higher than zero kelvin but of course not as high as the fermi temperature so that's what is the topic of our next lecture till then thank you stay safe